183. 183, I apologize. And 183. Oh, how I love Jesus. And we will sing all four verses. Hymn 183. services uh, on Sunday. Uh, all three of them I thought were uh, really good, and so I'm excited to be back in the house of the Lord tonight, uh, looking forward to uh, the lesson and interacting uh, with all of you. And so those of you watching on Facebook, remember, you can participate uh, in the lesson. Just put your responses in there, and our moderator will be your voice here in the room. All right, who else has a praise tonight? Yes, sir. Praise the Lord that we're at church. Praise the Lord that we're at church. Amen. And that's coming from a little one. Praise the Lord. All right, any other praises? Yes, ma'am. I want to praise the Lord that the weather seems to have cooled off a little bit today. Yeah, yeah. The weather has cooled off. Uh, it didn't get into the 90s. It just got into the upper 80s. So uh, we will take that. Uh, any reprieve of any kind. And it's been a little drier lately. So uh, it's great not having that humidity. You know, when it's humid like it is often, you walk outside and it just zaps you. All right. Yes, sir. Um, it may seem kind of, I don't, I don't want to sound like a bad one, but I praise the Lord that that front that was coming in out of the Gulf of Mexico was not going to hit the area that just got pummeled by Ida. And it's, you know, it's, you know, pray for those that are in the path of it, but it's it's not going to do, it's going to just rain and get some wind, but it's not going to go back over that area and hit them again. Right. Amen. That, that is a blessing. 
All right, unspoken prayer requests. Okay, most everyone. A uh, specific prayer request. Yes, sir. Pray that they have a good night's rest. No, a tear and a Loria. A tear and a Loria and Aurora will have a good night's rest. And, and the rest of us, too. We all could use a good night rest. Yeah. All right. Other prayer requests. Yes, sir. Um, it's a praise and prayer request. Um, my cousin Nathan, who we've been praying for, uh, got to go home from the hospital. Amen. Praise the Lord for that, but just pray for, continue to pray as he's got to recover. So. Yeah, he's got a long road of recovery ahead uh, ahead of him, so we certainly will be praying for him. Uh, and uh, also your, your great-grandmother and, and your uh, grandfather. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Any other prayer requests? I've got a list. All right, let me... Uh, uh, please continue to pray for Sister Garlene and family for health. Uh, please continue to pray for folks who started new jobs and those who are needing uh, either new jobs or, or, or adequate jobs. Uh, continue to pray for the financial needs of the church as well as families of the church. And then uh, please continue to pray for those that are pregnant. And those that uh, have new babies, whether they're first-time moms or, or not, they, they need our prayers. Uh, Tommy mentioned praising the Lord that that storm isn't going to follow up Ida. But we need to remember to pray uh, for those that were affected by Ida, both Tropical Storm Ida, Hurricane Ida, and then Tropical Storm Ida again. Uh, she really wreaked havoc. Uh, so we need to be praying for a lot of folks, a lot of wind damage, a lot of flooding damage, uh, and pray for those who uh, lost loved ones uh, during that. And then I need to continue to pray for Brother James Aguilera for his health, uh, working a lot of hours. And then also pray for his mother uh, who was battling with pneumonia. Uh, so need to keep her uh, in our prayers. And then, uh, please continue to pray for the situation in Afghanistan. Uh, and I'm not talking about the politics of it. I'm talking about the humanity. We have uh, U.S. citizens who are still there. We have troops that are still there. And we have missionaries and Christians uh, that are there and that are, are being targeted and will continue to be targeted. So we need to pray for that overall situation. Uh, we need to be praying... Uh, for Israel. And then uh, Valerie sent me an update. Sunday she had asked prayer uh, for the husband of a friend of hers whose arm was severed in an industrial accident at his place of employment. And she sent me uh, an update uh, because they were really concerned about being able to reattach the arm in a manner uh, that he would be able to use his arm and his hand both. And so let me read this real quick. She said, The surgical team had nothing but praise for the team at Piedmont Regional Hospital. In fact, they said that the emergency uh, team did such an amazing job saving pieces of Dad's hand and arm and of expertly placing the wound vac that the team at Grady was astonished. The word used was astonished. Uh, can I remind you that Piedmont wasn't sure uh, they were even capable of doing this type of surgery anyway. Because Piedmont Regional did such an incredible job cleaning the wound and saving uh, the, 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 the arm and hand and so forth, that they were able to uh, save one of the arm bones with a really long plate. The other was able to be wired back. Uh, 11 repaired tendons. Uh, praise the Lord for that. And the major nerve in the hand was repaired without taking nerves from anywhere else uh, in the body. And so uh, the sur uh, surgeons are very confident that there will be significant muscle regrowth over time. Uh, and so they said that uh, 
you know, if, if, if you're not sure uh, about miracles, that there were some uh, miracle aspects uh, of the recovery uh, to this injury. So we need to continue to pray uh, for this gentleman and that uh, pray for the teams that uh, God's will will be done, uh, that he will heal, uh, not as much as possible, but, you know, God is able. Yes, ma'am. Yes. Um, I, um, Miss Bonnie had an update to the prayer request from Sunday. Okay. Um, so for Miss Betty Lewis, um, Miss Bonnie said, please pray for our son's mother-in-law. She broke her hip and had to have a partial replacement. Now problems with blood pressure. Okay. And so that's Miss Betty Lewis. Miss Betty Lewis uh, had to have hip surgery after her fall, and she's having, you said, blood pressure? Yes. Issues after the surgery. Okay, so we need to keep her in our prayer. Also, when we pray for her, you know, I pray that the Lord will give these doctors wisdom um, in knowing the best course of action. Okay, any other prayer requests? You know, and that's what we're here for. This is midweek uh, prayer service, right? All right, if that's all, we'll go to the Lord in prayer and we'll receive the offering. All right, Heavenly Father, we bow into your presence right now, thankful for the many blessings. You heard the praises, and there are many more things we could praise you for. And if for nothing else, for salvation that you so freely have given to us, not because we're worthy, because we're certainly not, but because of your grace and your mercy. Now we bring these requests to you. There are a lot of folks that have a lot of uh, injury and illness, and we are just trusting them in your care. We know that your will is always best. We may not understand it uh, while things are going on, and we may not understand it this side of eternity, but it's enough to know that we can trust you no matter what the circumstances. We do pray that the doctors would have wisdom <coughs> Uh, dealing with this man that uh, suffered such a tragic injury uh, that they would be able to uh, repair the arm and the hand and Lord that he would be able to regain full use and we pray for the hip surgery and, and the blood pressure issues that you'd give those doctors wisdom as well. There are so many other folks that have so many things going on. We know that you are the great physician and we're just trusting your will and your work to be done. Now we pray for the financial needs of the church. You know what they are. You know what our needs are, what we think our needs are. And we just ask that you would meet those in your time. And again, according to your will, we pray for the financial needs of the families of the church. Some folks are going some, through some very difficult financial times. We ask that you would give them wisdom, that you would work in their situations. Now, Father, as we come to worship you with your tithe and offering, we ask that you'd accept it from a grateful and a joyful heart and that it would be used for the furtherance of the gospel. And we ask this in your precious and holy name. Amen. <laughs>
Second Timothy chapter 2 once again. Second Timothy chapter 2. He wants to tell me what we started last week. And that includes those of you online. You can participate in that too. That is being a soldier. Being a soldier in the army of God. That's right. And we said, um, although God doesn't have a draft, when you're saved, you are automatically inscripted into the Lord's army. Just like we teach the little ones when we teach them the song and we march, right? So the difference is, uh, even though you're, you're in the Lord's army, if you go UA, uh, which is unauthorized absence, meaning you don't participate, you don't do the things uh, that you should do as a soldier in the army for the Lord. Uh, remember, I said God's not going to send MPs for you, right? Right? And so we were looking at uh, 2 Timothy chapter 2, and we're going to go ahead and start reading in verse. Yes. Just a, just a comment. Um, you mentioned about not sending in peace. And I don't know, I just kind of had the thought of uh, what about those he sends across your path that are Christians living right to kind of, I don't, I don't want to say chastise, but chastise. I mean, well, they're not. They're, they're, they're not MPs, uh, right? Because if you're UA or in the Marine Corps or Navy or AWOL in the Army and Air Force, uh, the MPs go out and arrest you and throw you in the brig. Well, God's not going to throw you in the brig, but like Tommy said, uh, sometimes what the Lord does is worse. Uh, bringing people across your path uh, as a rebuke. And Vanessa reminded me of part of my testimony when I was outside God's will for my life doing what I wanted to do. Uh, God sent a Christian that was on fire to work with me, and he was a rebuke. He, he didn't know. He didn't know. He was a rebuke. And it was one of those... Every time we worked together, I would see him walk in and I would just bow my head and I'd like, I'd grumble. Because almost every day, 
that we worked together, he would come to me with a Bible question. And, you know, I was so far out of God's will, I'd have to put my cigarette down so I could talk to him because I wasn't going to talk about God and his word while holding a cigarette. I was just, you know, I was under conviction. But, uh, so yeah, God doesn't, sometimes I wish he had, he had sent MPs to throw me in the brig instead of sending uh, Mike Bowen uh, in, in my path. But uh, I thank God that he did. All right, we're going to go ahead and read 2 Timothy chapter 2, verses 1 through 4. He says, Thou therefore, my son, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus, and the things that thou hast heard of me among many witnesses, the same commit thou to faithful men, who shall be able to teach others also. Thou therefore endure hardness as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. No man that warreth entangleth himself in the affairs of this life, that he may please him who hath chosen him to be a soldier. All right, so last week, I think we made it into verse 2, right? Uh, we we're talking about being strong in grace. Now, why is grace important to the Christian? Because it's giving what you don't deserve. And we got grace from Christ. When we get it all the time from Christ. Right? So. And the key verse is for by grace are you saved through faith. Right? And so uh, I preached on this a few weeks back about grace. It's not a one-time application, is it? God extends his grace to us, like Tommy said, all the time. And we also should be extending God's grace through us to others, right? And then we are talking about, he said, and uh, the things that thou hast heard of me among many witnesses, the same commit thou to faithful men. And we are talking about what makes a faithful man. What do we say? Those of you online, if you were paying attention last week, if you were with us, help us out here. Those that are faithful in their um, spiritual life, so like in their Bible reading, prayer, and they're just consistent in their walk with the Lord and in their service to Him. I'm not correcting the Bible here, so please don't misunderstand. But when I think about what he said Commit thou to faithful men, a word you used, consistency. We have to be consistent. Uh, anybody can be off and on, right? On fire for God one minute, cold the next minute, right? That's, and there are some people, that's how they live. Why is that? What do you think drives them when they're hot one minute uh, or for a little while and then cold and indifferent? I know what I think. The flesh is the one thing that's going to drive them because oh. they're not, because they don't want to make a, they, they don't, the best way to describe it is they don't want to commit. They still want to live for self, but they know they need to live for Christ. So that's what's going to drive okay. them back and forth. It's going to be in that moment, depending on how they feel. Okay. Yeah. The flesh is a big part. Yes, ma'am. The emotions drive them. Yes. That's the answer I was looking for. The emotions, they're emotionally driven. And I'm not against emotions. I'm not against emotions at all. Uh, I will get emotional when, I, when I'm listening to good songs. Uh, I'll shout, I'll raise my hand, uh, I'll praise the Lord. Uh, when I preach, uh, I get excited and I will, I will raise my voice and Sometimes I'll pound the pulpit or, or what have you. So emotions aren't bad. But I, I heard a preacher say one time, emotions don't need to drive the bus. Right? Yes, ma'am. Yes. For Miss Valerie, circumstances bring them to God. Then when things get better, it's easy to stop depending on him. Woo! Yes. And you know what? God will use circumstances in our life to bring us to Him. Uh, 
But the sad thing is, and what she said was, when things get better, we forget him. Right? Because circumstances have changed and it's no longer driving us to him. And it's okay if circumstances drive us to the Lord, but we have to remember uh, that he is a necessity, regardless of the circumstances. Okay. So, uh, any other comments? Anybody? Okay. Now, the end of verse 2 says, Who shall be able to teach others? The who. These are the faithful men. And remember what I said last week. When he says men, uh, he, he's talking about mankind. So ladies, that includes you. Uh, to faithful men, who, the faithful men, shall be able to teach others also. Uh, do you want to be considered faithful to God? Yes. Anybody not want to be considered faithful to God, right? Are you able to teach others? Yes. You might say, well, God didn't call me to preach. God's not called me to be a Sunday school teacher. How do you know? Right? Every single child of God should be equipped to teach. Why? Yes, sir. In the back. Because that's how you're gonna. That's how you're gonna do it right. Is by teaching by folks being able to teach one to show others how to do it right, and, and making sure that way. Because if we don't, like, if I don't teach someone at work how to do whatever it is I'm, I'm asked to train them on, whether it's the breading of the machines, if I don't train them how to do it right, and something happens, they're gonna be like, well, I was never shown this. So in our Christian life. If we're teaching others, you know, how to, to be uh, a soul winner or um, just a, a faithful, a faithful, you know, on tithing or whatever it may be, we need to show them how to do it right, teach them how to do it right, because one day they may have to teach someone else how to do it, and they need to be able to say, okay, this is how I was shown, let me show you how it's done and what I've learned and, uh, you know, just how to be able to do it. We should teach others because we were taught. Okay. And because it, it doesn't need to die with us. There you go. Every single one of us, uh, we not that not that God is going to have you up up here teaching all of you. He may have you, like Tommy said, teaching one on one. Yes. Knowing the Bible, from Miss Valerie, knowing the Bible well enough to teach others helps us to learn more as well. Absolutely. I don't know if you caught that. If I believe that I'm going to have to teach somebody else, it should motivate me to make sure I know it as well as anybody can. Right? And so, he, he says, be able to teach others. Yes. Also, kind of skipping ahead way down to the end of the to the, about verse 15 in chapter 2, it says, Study to show thyself or prove unto God a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. And part of being taught is being able to rightly divide the Bible, knowing how to use it in its proper context and not take it out of context when situation arises. Right. And we, uh, you know, everybody learns a different way. There, there are times, and like when I do my messages, I, I know I have preacher friends who sit down at a computer and will type it out and just go crazy. I, I've tried that, but it's hard for me to sit down to a computer, but when I sit down with a notepad and a pen, it's, it's much easier for me. And in my learning over the years, I've learned that if I write it out longhand, that I will retain it better, right? Well, if I am teaching others, goes back to what you said, I am gonna learn it better. And the more I teach it, the better I learn it, right? Again, God may not put you in a position 
to be where I am teaching everybody that's here and everybody watching online, but he may put you in a situation where your closest workmate uh, is your student. And while you're working, and maybe at meal breaks or different things like that, uh, they ask questions, and you're then able to put this verse into practice. You're able to teach others, right? And sometimes I think we do a disservice when we think teaching is just the preacher in the pulpit or the Sunday school teacher, but it's every born-again believer because there are people that will open up to you that may not open up to me, right? And they're in your path, and that's not by accident. And so we all uh, have to be willing to take on this role, uh, and this is part of being a good soldier, is to teach others. All right, anything further on, on the end of verse 2? All right, moving along. Verse 3, thou therefore endure hardness as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. What does it mean to endure? Um, basically to... If, if I remember right, to go you go through something without complaining. Hmm. To go through something without complaining. Yes. I wasn't necessarily going to go that far, um, but I was thinking more um, like when a hurricane comes through or something like that. You can see some structures endured the storm. And even though they might have had some damage or something, they're still standing. Okay. And then there's others that are completely destroyed. That's a good analogy, and I think that's one that we all can identify with right now. If you couldn't hear her, she was talking about the storm or the building or structure that withstands a hurricane. Maybe it sustains some damage, and it's, it's a little worse for the wear, but it's still standing. And when I think of endure, uh, I think of outlasting. I didn't go as far as with an attitude, <laughs> but outlasting, yes. Miss Valerie said, withstanding the trials that come. Endure, withstanding the trials that come, yes. Although a good soldier would more than likely have a good attitude about enduring hardness? Well, we're talking about enduring. And, and good yeah. soldier. All right, yeah, we're talking about a good soldier. Miss Diane Wagner. All right, Miss Diane Wagner, a saint from our past. She had such a testimony. And she was the good soldier that endured with the best attitude anybody could have, right? And so we are to endure, we are to uh, outlast the, 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 the situation, right? Hardness. What's hardness? <laughs> Yes. Um, so sometimes with plants, I'm learning that like you can have seedlings and then you know you've, you've started them inside, but then you have to take them outside so they can harden and get acclimated to the elements of the weather. And sometimes you have to do that before you transplant them. And so, but they have to get used to, on one hand, get used to their surroundings so that way they don't just wither and, right. and die, have like culture shock or something. All right, you used the word acclimate, and that, mm -hmm. that's a good word. Now, one thing that he's not talking about is when he talks about hardness, of course, he's not talking about a hardening of one's heart, right? I'll get to you. Hardening of one, one's heart. 
Now that's what Satan will do uh, when you're trying to endure. Okay, yes, ma'am. Um, so for Miss Valerie, when you think about who wrote the books of Timothy, most likely. And then for Miss Karen, to go through the trial in a manner that pleases the Lord. Oh, she beat you. <laughs> to go through the trial in a manner, and here's the key, in a manner that pleases the Lord. And that, I think, is the essence of a good soldier. But what did Valerie say about hardness? Um, when you think about who wrote the books of Timothy, most likely. Who wrote it? Paul. Paul. If there was anybody that understood uh, the, the harshness of being a soldier for God, it was Paul, right? He was stoned. He was beaten. He was shipwrecked. He was uh, put in stocks, right? Bitten by a snake, right? And so hardness... It's a hardship when he talks about it. He says, to endure hardness. In my notes I wrote, uh, undergoing hardship, being an, uh, afflicted, and enduring, enduring affliction and suffering troubles. Right? That sounds like a description of the Apostle Paul's life. And so when he writes to Timothy, thou therefore endure hardness as a good soldier of Jesus Christ, he's got some authority behind him. Another person you think of too that was great in enduring hardness was Job. Oh, Job, right? Uh, Job. Think about it. Job was not on Satan's radar until, until Job went before the Lord and, and God said hmm? Satan. Satan went before the Lord thank you Satan went before the Lord and God said hey look over there you see him he'll stand against you right that's like somebody sicking a bulldog on you right <laughs> oh I did it for you right Job, he, he suffered, and he endured, right? He was faithful to God uh, till, till the end. God rewarded him, gave him back double what he lost. And so when we think about enduring hardness, what are some hardnesses that in the 21st century, we might face. I mean, we could go back and we look at Paul, we look at Job, and we see all the things that they faced. Well, let's bring that forward now. Here we are in the 21st century. What are some hard hardships that we may face? It may not seem like some to others, but uh, moving forward at work because of how you've taken a stand on you know, you, you said I'm going to be in church and you can't advance at work. Because okay. Of what you would have to, more responsibilities you'd have to pick up that may take you away from the Lord and what you've already committed to. All right, that's good. I think that's very valid. Tommy said some of the hardship may be uh, what a Christian goes through at work, right? If they've made a commitment, listen, I can't work Sundays. Because I, I, I want to be in church, and Wednesday night I want to be in church. And so the powers that be uh, say, well, you can't commit to what we need, then you don't get to advance. And some people might say, well, that's not a hardship. I don't know. If the advancement means that you are going to be compensated better for your time, and right, you're trading your time for money, and you're using that money to provide for your family, and so you're not being allowed to advance, right? 
So I, I do see that. What else? Um, well, Ms. Karen commented many times trials are a test of our faith. Absolutely. And think about Job again. Right? Job's friend said, Job, confess your sin, get right with God, and this won't happen. And too many times we do that. We're going to say, you know, if you just confess, but we don't know that. And we don't know that, and our friends don't know that, and people looking don't know it, and it very well is a test. Um, well, on that note, would Job like... Job knew whether or not he was right with the Lord or not. That's right. You know, and nobody else knew by looking at him. That's what right. He was. Um, but like Job, he was affected by boils. You know, I think in the 21st century, a lot of the hardships can become come because of health. Yes. You know, um, whether it's health because of a genetic disease or whether it's health because of environmental you know, like you think of, you know, asbestos and, and things people were exposed to. Right. Um, or whether it's helped because of a trauma they received, um, as in a car accident or an accident of any kind. Um, you know, anything like that. And a lot of those are not visible. Mm -mm. Right? And so, um, of course, part of the hardship, it's, it's a double whammy because you have the physical... But then you also have the societal, because society looks at you, and you're not bleeding, right? So they don't see it, so it doesn't exist. What else? Did you have another? Um, another, I mean, the work situation was mentioned, but um, financial, you know, these days, you know, people have cars, you know, and unlike in Job's time where they their transportation was primarily by foot um, these days you might have to go some distance to get to work or to, to go between groceries and so forth so if there's a vehicle issue you know that can be a really big hardship right um, or you know just transportation issues and then um, you know the financial that compiles because of that one of the hardships I was thinking about that uh, it's not as bad in the United States as it is in other places, but it's getting worse. It is the persecution that Christians are facing. Christian business people who take a stand for the Lord uh, are being uh, persecuted literally in the courts uh, because they're taking a stand. They say this uh, this is God's business, and uh, we reserve the right to refuse service, and they're being persecuted for it. Uh, preachers have been arrested uh, for preaching certain things. Uh, preachers have been arrested for having Bible studies in their home, yes, in the United States. And this thing over the last year and a half, almost two years, uh, the churches that were being persecuted uh, for having services, for having uh, drive-up services where all the families stayed in their automobiles and the preacher was inside and yet they were still being persecuted. All right, that's hardship. Remember that one church in Mississippi, King James Bible Baptist Church. Preacher was inside in the pulpit preaching. The members were in their vehicles in the parking lot, and the police came up, knocked on the windows, and said, you have to leave, or you're, you're going to be given a ticket for $500. While down the street, the Sonic Restaurant, which is a drive-up, and actually you interact with people, was open. Right? So this is the world in which we live. Um, they were saying certain stores were allowed to be open because they were essential. And they were saying that churches were not essential. Uh, some governors stepped out and said, no, our churches are. Right? And I'm not trying to get into politics. I'm just saying this is some of the hardship of the 21st century. 
And, yes, ma'am. Something um, that a lot of Christians face um, is censorship. And whether that be on social media platforms or video platforms, um, or even in the local, you know, news. Right. Um, that's something that um, good is now being censored because it is being considered bad. Right. So if you couldn't hear, she said censorship. It is happening with social media platforms. It's happening with video uh, platforms and even local uh, platforms, the old newspapers and print. And, uh, but we are seeing the Bible lived out in front of us. The Bible said that there will come a time when people call good evil and evil good. And we're seeing a lot of that. And, and one of the things there's, and I'm not getting into a debate, but there are folks who have strong opinions about not being vaccinated and not being forced to wear masks. And they are being uh, treated uh, rather poorly, Try, uh, a lot of peer pressure, trying to force people into uh, doing those things. Um, and it's some, some states are encouraging neighbors to report neighbors if they have too many people in their home. Uh, that is so ridiculous. But that is part of what's going on. And so uh, some might say, does that compare, you know, how can you compare that to what Job went through or what Paul went through? Uh, I'm not saying it's worse, but I'm saying this is some of the things that's going on. And I will say, I believe it's going to get worse. Yes, sir. Um, another hardship just happened to think of is um, finding faithful men, you know, because a lot of times you'll find those that outwardly look good, but then when hardship comes, you don't have someone to ride the river with. Right. Yes. <sighs> it is. It is. As he said, one of the one of the difficulties it seems today is finding those faithful men, those faithful women. Right? A lot of people are drawn to entertainment. Well, my pastor said many years ago, and he put it on the sign out front: the Christian life is not a playground; it's a battlefield. And it is a battlefield. It's a battleground, not a playground. And it is a spiritual battle. And Satan knows, I've said it a hundred times, that Satan knows how to make sin attractive mm -hmm. and enjoyable. Uh, and he's, he's learned how to make it look not so bad that it draws people away. And they don't see the danger. And the danger may not be outright physical, but it's far worse. It's spiritual. Drawing people away from God and those who do not know him as their savior, it's, it's just taking them further away from him, if that's possible, uh, putting obstacles in their way to convince them that they're okay, they, uh, they don't need a... a, a greater relationship with God or a better relationship with God that what they have is okay. I've always, I, this is the way I've always done it and that's one of the worst things you can, you know, uh, and, and that's the way we're going to do it. And one of the worst things I, I hear and it makes me cringe is when somebody says, well, my daddy never went to church and my grandpa never went to church. I don't need to go to church. Mm. So, hardships, but if you're, you know, you can advance at work, but it might cost you not being a good soldier. You may have to compromise. Eh, Sundays aren't important. 
church isn't important. Or I go on Sundays, I can miss on Wednesdays. Or I go Sunday night, I can miss Sunday morning. I'm not a fanatical Christian. I go when I go. But here's the thing. That analogy or illustration I just used about my daddy didn't do it and my grandpa didn't do it. What's your child or grandchild going to say? See, what's important to you will be important to them. Right? All right. Well, we're going to... Any, anything else? Anything from anybody online? Not at this point. Anything from anybody here? Everybody good? All right. We're going to have a word of prayer, and we'll be dismissed. All right. Our Heavenly Father, we do thank you so much that you've called us to be good soldiers of Jesus Christ. And you did that when you saved us. I ask that you would help us to respond to that and that we would be good soldiers and that we would endure the hardship that has come and that we know is coming. The Lord, I ask that you dismiss us with your blessing, bring us back again on Sunday, and we ask this in your precious and holy name. Amen.